Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Global Connections. And today we're going to talk about Mongolia. We're going to ask where does Mongolia stand in every which way? And what is its presence in the United States? Uh, with Ralph Winnie, who consorts and confers with Mongolians all the time in, in uh, these conferences he does in Washington, these academic conferences. And one was recently, I guess it was in April, late April. It was, the, it was a conference about Mongolia. Then we have our regular contributor, Stephanie Stoltalton. So, Ralph, would you start by telling us about the conference you had in April, late April, uh, with and about Mongolia in Washington? Uh, yes, thank you, Jay. Um, the conference was sponsored by the Mongolia Society of the U.S., um, which is an organization designed to promote people-to-people -people exchanges and relationship building between the United States and the nation of Mongolia. So they have a conference every year to, where they bring the scholars and diplomats and business leaders together to promote the history and the culture uh, and of the nation of Mongolia, which is a really fascinating connection with the United States, even though it was a, a, a former communist country, um, the people were never anti-American. They were very pro-United States. And Mongolia has maintained this relationship with Russia, China, and the United States in a very unique um, dynamic way where they can promote and establish uh, their cultural and business ties and at the same time be a catalyst for um, bridge building and peace. You know, um, when North Korea um, was... Um, getting very agitated, you know, setting off rockets, as we saw. Mongolia was one of the partners that the United States looked to, to see about helping make a bridge um, to, have a, and to have a dialogue between the United States. Um, well, uh, you know, I, I uh, recall that uh, Mongolia is, in fact, independent. Correct. I also recall that independence is not easy, just like democracy in general is not sure. easy. And um, because it's surrounded um, with, you know, countries that would like to take a piece of its yeah. resource uh, or, you know, um, do something invasive against Mongolia, it manages through, you know, diplomatic uh, strategies and otherwise, remarkably, to stay independent. Even after all these years of exercising those strategies, it is still independent, which is to its credit. Um, how does it do that, Ralph? Well, I think it starts with an understanding how important it is to maintain strong diplomatic ties with China, Russia, and the United States. So they will send their, their young people to study and to be able to um, train and learn in United States, Russia, and China. So they will be able to develop the personal and professional relationships that are necessary when they return to Mongolia and then enter into the diplomatic corps. Mm, yeah. Ralph, Ralph, how did Mongolia emerge as an entity sandwiched between Russia and China? I, I mean, looking at the map, is yeah. it's just like full alert DEFCON 5. I mean, how did they, man is this a because of the Genghis Khan history? What can you tell Well, it started with Genghis Khan, but there was a series of power bargains that the Mongolians had with China, uh, but more important, uh, Russia and also Japan, you know, to stay engaged uh, and to protect and promote their sovereignty. People forget, you know, that China was not a powerhouse. It was considered the sick man of Asia and other countries were trying to occupy it. So they were very, the Mongolians were very conscious of that happening to them. So they would forge strategic alliances with the Americans, the Europeans, and the Russians to prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. You know, before the show, I mean, Stephanie, you were talking about um, the you were talking about the resources uh, in Mongolia, which yes. are very attractive to you know their neighbors and to countries around the world. Can uh, Stephanie? Can you list some, and then uh, Ralph can give us more on that. Yes, that's so interesting because they, they have considerable gold resources, copper, coal, 
They've got uranium and tin and tungsten and a couple of other things that I don't know too much about. But that can be uh, an advantage and a disadvantage. So have they uh, are they important to um, Russia and China for those resources? And has that protected them or how has those worked? Well, they, they've they been able to sign major deals with Russia, China and the United States um, to harness and use the resources in a way that is going to be beneficial uh, for Mongolia, as well as their joint venture partners, whether it's, you know, the United States, uh, China or Russia. I mean, I think we've got in some of our major companies, whether it's Caterpillar, or Monsanto um, or the main mining, top mining companies, you know, um, in there to really harness and leverage the resources. I think another strong uh elements that the Mongolians are able to bring to the table is that they were very aggressive in wanting to be part of the Millennium Challenge Compact, the Millennium Challenge Corporation that the United States established. What is so they, that? Well, it was a compact that was set up under the Bush administration as a way to reward countries that promoted human rights and democracy, and they would be given funding for different projects. Um, and I had a chance, you know, uh, when I worked at a firm back in 2004, um, to be able to take a look at their tax treaty that they were setting up between the United States and Mongolia, and also the compact as they were preparing to submit the compact to the Lenin Challenge Corporation. Um, the firm that I worked with had a relationship not only with an office in China, but there was a firm client that was looking to expand their forging factory operations from China into Mongolia. And that's what took me into Mongolia to sort of get the layout of the land and see what would be available. So I went to the tax and trade office to look at what tax breaks and different incentives might be available for this company, which is a forging factory operation out of California, to see you know whether it would be beneficial for them to move their operations out of China uh, into Mongolia. So I was able to find some land where they could have leased. And um, I was able to witness several kind of joint ventures. But to, one was a, um, a, a German and Austrian brewery, um, you know, with uh, that, that had partnered with the Mongolian brewery. Um, and another one was um, the Army Medical Hospital. You know, um, because getting new and updated medical equipment was very, very important for the Mongolians. Mm. Yeah. And that's another area where they've been able to partner with the United States, working with Christian churches and bringing over doctors and seeking medical equipment to help improve the quality of their medical system in Mongolia. And you go to the hospital in Mongolia, uh, very clean. The doctors are well-educated, well-trained. They just don't have the basic necessities. They were relying on Russian equipment. So part of the Millennium Challenge Corporation was to give them the funding where they can grow and expand you know, their health care, um, their infrastructure, their IT, um, and uh, to continue to modernize um, and to stay engaged with the U.S. as a trusted and reliable partner. You know, we think of Mongolia as something out of the, uh, the 19th century. We think of the yurts. We think yes. of these, you know large areas of land that are spectacular right. it, it, with scenery, but there's nothing much going on there. Um, mm -hmm. We don't think of them as high tech. We don't think of them as Akamai and business issues. Yeah. Uh, we don't think of them as strong in personalities, relationships, including foreign foreign relationships, right. geopolitical consciousness. And you you are painting a picture here that's entirely different than. You know, the picture that we traditionally have about Mongolia. I well, remember, the Russian, yeah, the, the Mongolians um, took great pride in promoting education and workforce development. And it started under their relationship and engagement with Russia. The Russians set up an elaborate network of schools um, and infrastructure projects within the country. And the Mongolians, when they opened up to the West in the early 90s, they really grew, that really grew and expanded uh, with their relationship with the United States and bringing in um, some of the major companies. Um, so you have a well-educated, well-trained workforce. You've got a lot of women that have been in positions of power there. And you've got sort of a, a mindset and an openness 
to really engage and trade with the West. Mm. Um, you know, and they and they had they were they many of them trained in Moscow initially under the old generation. Um, I studied at Moscow State University, and that really gave me an entree when I went to Mongolia because many of their top leaders had trained there. Um, so having Russian there was helpful. But you could sense there was a move away from Russia and more towards engagement with West, with the United States and Western Europe. Um, is, and that, that's is, that of, is. is that because of is that because of Ukraine, Ralph? I mean, uh, you know, with this conference you had where everybody was yeah. there in April yeah. um, was in the, you know, in the lap of, of the of the Ukraine invasion. And there must have been discussions about Russia as um, uh, a pariah um, and trying to manipulate and invade and, um, you know, um, do destruction in Ukraine. Uh, so query, what what were the what did what did the uh, Mongolians say about that? Did they tell you how they felt about it? They were a little coy about it. I think they are supportive of Ukraine, um, but they don't want to antagonize Russia, and they certainly want to keep strong relations with the United States. So, anytime you talk with them, it's about how can we grow and develop our economy, how can we preserve and protect our culture. So they had um, they talked about Mongolian art. It talked about um, this particular Mong uh, Mongolian ferret that was endangered. Um, it cannot be domesticated. Um, and then we had my presentation, my research associate and I, we presented on uh, Mongolia's inter independence uh, from China. Mm. Uh, and then there was an opportunity to engage with the diplomatic community. Uh, so there were the um, ambassador of Mongolia was there and several former diplomats that had served in Mongolia. Um, there's an organization called the Zurich Foundation that I was on the board of many, many years ago, and that was designed to help that bridge between the United States and Mongolia on the um, you know, personal private side to help support and promote the Mongolian culture. You know, on the personal private side, Mongolian culture, I, yeah. I met a retired chief justice of the Mongolian Supreme Court. Yeah. Um, we, uh, uh, we went to a restaurant here in Honolulu together, and uh, I found two things significant uh, about him. No, number one, um, he was well, well educated in English. He could speak yes. English. And yeah. the other is he had a terrific sense of humor. And I suppose yeah. I can also say he had a powerful personality. In other words, right. if you put him at a negotiating table, he'd be the kind of um, you know person who could negotiate a deal, and it would be rational. Um, right. It would be right up to you know global standards. So sure. you know, it seems to me that's one you know that combination of skills is is a great success feature uh, for yes. the Mongolians. They can go talk to people. They can make deals. Right. You can't take advantage of them because they're Akamai about those things. Right, right. Am I right? Yeah. You're absolutely correct. And that started when they were trained under the former Soviet system, which taught them to be very Akamai and very tough and aggressive. But at the same time, they use that in a very positive way, where, as you said, they don't lose their sense of humor. Um, and they do, and they engage in a way where they're not gratuitously insulting people, they're not looking down on another culture, which traditionally the Russians had done towards the Chinese and, and to other um, former Soviet bloc republics and to many of the Eastern European countries where Russian is not favored anymore. It was a language that was forced on them. So the Mongolians really utilized the best that the Russian system could offer in terms of education and know-how. Um, and they have taken it in a way where they can really succeed on the diplomatic front. And that's when I brought up North Korea. North Koreans can't dismiss them because they were they recognized that they were part of the old Soviet system. At mm -hmm. the same time, they they recognize that the Mongolians um, have to engage in trade with the West. So the Mongolians don't look down on the North Koreans. So the Mongolians are going to be more likely to get something out of North Korea, or be able to at least understand what the leadership is thinking and be able to help, you know, the United States 
uh, when we're trying to engage and bring North Korea to the table to bargain. Well, g- uh, given all of that, given those uh, skills and this uh, yeah. remarkable, remarkable orientation of uh, Mongolia to its neighbors and to the world, um, you know, it really is a, an unusual situation and, and remarkable in the sense that here's a landlocked country uh, sure. so, surrounded by people who, you know, could be aggressive with it, um, but it manages. So, Stephanie, um, take a whack. What should American <laughs> foreign policy vis-a-vis Mongolia, what should it be given all of those factors? Well, it sounds like we're uh, partners in many ways. Uh, there's lots of connections, a lot, lot, yeah. lot of, lot of uh, co- loops and links, yeah. right? And that's what they're trying to build on. But right. That and on the personal front, I wanted to say one of the things that the Mongolians like to do is they like to sing and they like to dance. So when we were at our reception, um, I sang along in Mongolian and um, met some new friends just dancing with several of the Mongolians. So that's and a- they like that. That's a way to develop that personal tie. And which, that's, uh, that's an indigeneity thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, but oh, okay. So I wanted to ask about the status of individuals. I mean, what what is the per capita income? Are these people um, in in lifestyles that that are um, comfortable? What's their lifestyle like in the villages? Um, it's still, you know, economic. They they have some economic challenges. A lot of it has to do with the the, the terrain, the weather. Um, it's traditionally been a very nomadic society. So as they've had to stop being able to herd the animals and to move into the cities, that's presented challenges. There's been issues with pollution. Um, and so that's why it's important to have American know-how, ingenuity, and business mindsets over there where they can mentor and train and engage, you know, with Mongolian companies. Well, that group, uh, for instance, that you mentioned. Yes. That was right. The, you know, so d- is that flourishing? And so Yeah, they- that was flourishing. I mean, al- um, alcohol is a very big part of their society. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, vodka, it's, that comes from the Russian mm-hmm. system as well. But um, they routinely drink a lot of vodka and a lot of hard liquor. So that was sort of a no-brainer to have that kind of a business. Yeah, it sounds like, like they're, they're yeah. well-rounded you know, people. Yeah. So exa- examining our relationship with them, you know, yeah. um, you know to, to me, um, uh, any study of foreign policy has to be a look into the future. Right. It, it has to, you know, you have to see where things are going and see the trends and see all the factors in play and all that. And, and it's to our advantage, clearly to our advantage, to have a, a sustainable relationship with Mongolia. And right now, from what you say, it sounds like we have a pretty good relationship. But, I think so. Know, foreign policy is, is uh, these days, it's a function of the divisiveness that we see uh, in government in this country. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's a, you know, it's a function of people being ignorant of, of, of Mongolia and what it should mean to us. So my question to you is, um, if you were running the State Department, and who knows, Ralph, maybe one day, um, if you were running the State <laughs> Department, what, what kind of foreign policy would you, would you um, design uh, for Mongolia? I would want the U.S. to stay engaged with them through um, something like the Millennium Challenge Corporation and to make sure that we have our State Department diplomats our private sector actively engaged, not only in the cities, but in the rural areas and providing advice and counsel and guidance to them there on the ground and to bring more and more Mongolia students over to the United States to be trained and educated and to develop new technologies, you know, that would be beneficial for both the U.S. and Mongolia. Um, Also ensuring that there is access to minerals, oil, uh, mining, met- metallurgy, uh, textiles are very, very important. So we don't have to rely on, specifically on China. Um, but you can use Mongolia certainly as a, as a resource, um, not only on the economic side, but on the diplomatic front. Once we continue to empower them and 
engender their respect and trust, it's going to be very easy to integrate them into any kind of negotiation that we may have with um, the Russians, the Chinese, and or the North Koreans moving forward, because that's going to be the key. I had the for I was fortunate to meet the president of Mongolia back in 2011, and that was sort of his vision. I mean, he had the notion of how to deal with the Russians. He spoke fluent Russian, but also respecting China on their border and also actively wanting to trade and engage with the United States. So you have to recognize that the Mongolian president, whoever he may be in the near future, is ha has to recognize the dynamics of the neighbors that he's surrounded by, but at the same time, really wants to to engage with the United States because that's where they consider the future to be. United is it, States is it politicized? Is it politicized? I mean, we have a a certain uh, c a contingent of isolationists in in the country and in our government these days. Um, are there people who would not want to have relations with Mongolia? I don't think you have really negative issues regarding Mongolia. Um, they're not considered a threat. Um, they can be a powerful ally in many regards. Um, so I think as long as you know, you can show them that we're producing results. I mean, the fact that Millennium, that Mongolia was accepted, I think, as a second or third country to the Millennium Challenge Corporation, shows that they are a country that's you know committed to human rights, democracy, and Western business practices. What about uh, Western law? They're not corrupt. You know, mm -hmm. so that's the big issue that certain elements in the government in here have towards Ukraine, that they think that the government is very corrupt and we're throwing money down the drain. There's, you know, uh, we're not seeing any results. You don't, won't have that with Mongolia. Um, and I think specifically getting them into the compact was that key. Um, so moving that forward, making sure we don't take our eye off the ball and that they don't revert back to any kind of system where there's graft and corruption is gonna be key. <laughs> What about um, what about their government? Is it representative government? Uh, can you say it's a democratic government? Do they enjoy civil rights and freedom of the press? Yeah, um, well, yes, what? they do. Yeah, it's. Um, I would well, say uh, women have a, are in positions of power there. Um, so, I mean, yeah. I do see that they're, they're totally, almost totally dependent on Russia for energy. So is that right. for the cities, right? How is it? Is it like a half-half situation where you have the cities and then you have the yurt and the rural? Yeah, problem? you have the rural areas, right. Yeah. Is it about half-half? Um, I would say, well, the, the cities, while large, I think there's still that rural population. That's and that's where, that's where you need to get the aid to is to people in the rural areas to move them out of poverty into the middle class. Specifically, that's what the Chinese have been doing. So they, you could use stimulus funding oh, I see. Um, to really, job. you know, heart, establish an elaborate freeway system, setting up power grids, mm -hmm. creating new sectors of business development opportunity by going into underdeveloped areas. Well, did you mention that they're not able to herd have horses any longer? Did you say something? Well, well they they still do, but it's it'll it's getting harder because you know the nomadic life is it's hard when you have to fence things because of modernity. Yeah, modernity, right? So they're kind of balancing that because oh, that. they recognize they have a huge, you know, uh, this that's their culture was um, right. they're very nomadic. And that's so, changed, and it's changed over a fairly short period of time. It, it has, yeah. So that presents challenges and opportunities at the same time. Mm -hmm. You've got to manage the risks and leverage the benefits. You know, I couldn't tell from the maps that I saw. Now, is would you say that that Mongolia is half the size of Ukraine? Um, is can you just give a? Uh, uh, you yeah, know, I would say that's the right accurate. Yeah. And so why it, it is not in any way a threat to China or Russia, right? That they no. have the regions under control, so they're safe, right? And right. Now, China has sort of uh, used up their, you know, Mongolia's textile industry has almost been absorbed into China. So that was a challenge for them. Oh. You know? so, so they are, are you saying they, um, that China is, is um, buying their manufactured textiles? They're textiles, yeah. They're cheaper. 
Mm -hmm. the rugs. So that can present some challenges for them. Mm -hmm. So they're not a threat. I mean, they're a great uh, source of opportunity for a lot of for for countries. Well, China has been outsourcing manufacturing for the exactly. last couple of years, and then that's yeah. got to be part of it. Uh, a right. couple of other, couple of other questions come to mind, and one of them is the exchange of people. I mean, are uh, Americans going to Mongolia? Are they traveling as tourists there? Is it a, a good experience? Are Mongolians coming to the United States and and seeking visas and uh, immigration possibilities? Um, I think the Mongolians are coming to the U.S. to study, and mm -hmm. many of them do stay. Um, as far as people going to Mongolia, it really needs to pick up. It's not as easy to get to. I was fortunate to go because I was already in China at the time, and it just became easy to fly from Beijing into Ulaanbaatar uh, mm -hmm. and spend a week there. Mm -hmm. So um, there are Mongolia um, travel um clubs, travel agencies that you can go through um, that'll plan trips for you to go, especially in the summer, to be in a, to live in a yurt and and to, you know, uh, be able to spend time backpacking and touring the country. Um, and that's that's going to be important, I think, because our soft power, I think, is one of our most invaluable resources and uh, as a force for good when they meet Americans, you know, then they become inspired and want to be able to come over here and to to learn about our culture. Mm. So, yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, they've also got to look at the tax breaks and different incentives for companies to be able to want to, you know, uh, set up business opportunities there. And that's going to be key under any kind of um, government in Mongolia. Make it you as know, in, affordable in various, as possible. In, in very, uh, various places um, in the world and in Asia, there are um, economic groups of, of, of countries like uh, ASEAN would yes. be a good example of that. Uh, is Mongolia a member of any such group uh, of, of countries that are trying to um, do economic exchange and collaboration? Um, I think they would they work they work directly with Russia, China, the United States, and Europe. So it's bilateral. Uh, bilateral, yeah, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, they're they want to do as much as they can to have positive economic and diplomatic relations with different countries. Yeah. So. Well, what about Kyr Kyrgyzstan is their neighbor, too. Right. That isn't that one of the stand that's closest to Kyrgyzstan. Them? Kyrgyzstan. Has somebody no. got bells ringing there. There's bells ringing. I will have to clip oh. this out. Oh, it know. sounds like a telephone going. Oh, okay. Is that Anymore? yours, Stephanie? No, it, no, no. My, no. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Maybe it was a call from someone in Mongolia. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Dialing into your show. <laughs> they tried to it's call in. Ring. <laughs> they tried yeah. to call in. <laughs> well, we're about we're about done, you guys. Oh. Anyway, so yeah. let me let me ask. Um, hopefully, we will not have bells ringing. Uh, let me ask Ralph. What would you What would you leave with our viewers and listeners? Um, how they should see Mongolia, how they should see it in their world view, um, how should they see the Mongolians and the Mongolian culture and the sure. achievements of of Mongolia. Well, on a personal level, I think um, the Mongolians they are a really fun, loving people. They like to sing. They like to dance. They're very open. They're very friendly. Um, they're also a little shy, you know, because especially if they for, they come over to the United States for the first time, it's a very different experience for them. But um, I've met many of them through the sport of wrestling. Um, mm. As you know, I was a former wrestler. And that's been I one thought, of, I thought I think, you were a lawyer and an academician. I sure am. Yeah, but I can be very dangerous as a wrestler and a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they so like that. there are Mongolians at our wrestling club that come. And um, it's a great way to get to know them on that personal level, whether through it's a sport or just through their their ancient Mongolian um, dancing and, and uh, music. Um, on a professional level, um, they're very sharp talented 
smart people, as Jay has laid out in this show. Um, they've, you know, understood how to engage in the Russian system. The, you know, they know how to trade and engage with China, and they they are do, they are developing very strong relationships with the U.S. and Europe, um, both on the personal and the professional side. That is going to continue to grow. And I think it's important for people in the West to really um, extend their hand in friendship to Mongolia that's moving in the direction of economic peace and prosperity, that's moved away from the graft and the corruption that really was um, indicative of many of the um, of the Soviet Union and the former Soviet bloc countries as they've mm-hmm. had to engage in their transition as they wanted to move in the direction of the West, but they didn't have the, the warehouse, the business know-how. Yeah. That's why I think it's going to be very important for a small and medium-sized business to, you know, develop a personal mentorship partnerships with Mongolian companies um, to help them grow and develop and expand their enterprises, well, especially you know, to grow a small business there. They will. They will. Uh, people in the community yeah. call it the international uh, right. aware community in the U.S. will have their chance because the. Mongolian conference that you organized in April is every year, isn't it? And, Correct. And so they'll come back and there'll be other opportunities. Thank you very much, Ralph. And very thank good. you, Stephanie. Aloha. Thank You're you, welcome. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.